All right, so get ready because today we're diving headfirst into something pretty wild. It's a mathematical paradox that might just make you question, well, everything you thought you knew. It's called the Banach Tarski paradox. Yeah, this one's a real brain bender. We're basically talking about, well, imagine taking something tiny, like a pea, and somehow, just by moving it around, turning it into something as huge as the sun. It's pretty mind-blowing, right? And our listeners send us some seriously heavy-duty material to unpack. We've got an excerpt from the Encyclopedia of Mathematics all about the paradox, plus a whole master's thesis that goes even deeper. And we're talking about some pretty complex stuff here. Free groups, amenability. They even mention the Scottish book, which is a whole other rabbit hole. But don't worry, we'll try to break it all down and make sense of it. So at its core, this paradox says you can duplicate a solid object. Mm. And not by like, I don't know, 3D printing it, right. but by just using rigid motions. Right, rigid motions. Basically moving it around without like stretching or squashing it. Think rotations, translations, that kind of thing. Wait, hold on. Duplicate. Like making an exact copy. How is that even possible just by moving something? It definitely goes against our intuition. The whole thing hinges on the concept of infinity. You see, if you have an infinite number of points, you can divide them into two sets that are both, well, still infinite. And they're, in a sense, identical to the original set. So it's not like we're physically cutting up a P and creating more like P stuff. It's more about how we think about sets and what was called transformations in mathematics. Exactly. That's it. The P and the sun analogy is just a way to, I guess, illustrate the sheer scale of the paradox. We're not really talking about matter, but about how in math you can rearrange sets in ways that just wouldn't work in the real world. And you, you said this only works in three dimensions, right? Yeah. Not in, say, one or two. Why is that? Do lower dimensions have different rules? They do. It boils down to the, uh, the kinds of transformations you're allowed in each dimension. Take the sierpieski mazurkovich paradox, for instance. It's in two dimensions. You can duplicate a single point using rotations and translations, but you can't pull off the whole P to the sun thing. Okay, so there's something about three dimensions that makes this possible. But how does it actually work? What's the math behind this duplication? This is where things get really interesting. The heart of it all is something called a free group. A free group. Hmm. Sounds a bit rebellious. What are they exactly, and how do they fit into all of this? In a way, they are kind of rebellious, at least mathematically speaking. Free groups capture the idea of independent transformations. Imagine you have a set of rotations, like um, the ones described by the Sato rotations. You can find their matrix representations in that thesis. Okay, I think I vaguely remember seeing those. Right, so these rotations form a free subgroup, meaning you can combine them in an infinite number of ways, and you won't run into any constraints or repetitions. So they're like... I don't know, building blocks. You can use them to create all sorts of different structures with no limits. Exactly. And because of that freedom, you can use free groups to create transformations that, well, duplicate sets. Yeah. Which is the key to making the paradox work. So free groups are, are powerful tools. But why does this only work in three dimensions? Why does the number of dimensions matter so much? I'm still a bit lost there. That's a great question. It brings us to the concept of amenability. It's a property of groups that's related to uh, something called invariant measures. Invariant measures. Sounds a bit technical. Can you break that down for me? Think of an invariant measure as a way to measure the size of a set. It could be length, volume, that kind of thing. But it's like a super robust measuring tape. It still works even if you twist and turn the set, you know, move it all around. It gives you a way to compare sizes consistently even after all those transformations. So it helps you keep track of how big something is, even when things get really, well, chaotic with all those rotations and movements. Exactly. Now, in one and two dimensions, the groups of transformations that preserve distance, we call them isometries, are amenable. Their sizes behave nicely. So everything stays kind of predictable in those lower dimensions. You could say that. But in three dimensions, the isometry group. It's not amenable. It's like the Wild West out there. And that lack of amenability is what opens the door for the Banach-Tarski paradox to happen. Wow. Three dimensions really are where things get weird with infinity and transformations. Yeah. Speaking of weird, the thesis also mentioned these things called Myselski sets. What are those all about? Ah, Myselski sets. Those are truly mind-boggling. You see, you can remove any finite number of points from them, but it doesn't actually change their essential size, at least as measured by those invariant measures we talked about. Wait, how is that possible? If you remove something, shouldn't it get smaller? How can the size stay the same? Well, 
it comes down to that counterintuitive nature of infinity. Imagine, let's say, a circle. You remove a single point from it. Well, a circle with a missing piece is definitely different from a complete circle. True, but with a Myshelsky set, you can find a transformation that perfectly maps the original circle onto the one with the missing point. It's like rearranging the remaining points to fill in the gap, even though it seems impossible. So you kind of stretch out the rest of the points to cover the whole circle. Yeah, that's a good way to visualize it. And the fact that these Myshelsky sets exist is deeply tied to our ability to even create those paradoxical decompositions in the first place. They really highlight how different our intuition about size and infinity can be from what's actually mathematically possible. Okay, I'm starting to see how all these pieces fit together. Free groups give us the tools. That lack of amenability in three dimensions makes the paradox possible. But there was one more thing that caught my eye in that encyclopedia entry. The axiom of choice. It seems a bit, I don't know, controversial. What's its role in all of this? Ah, yes, the axiom of choice. It's a very powerful principle in math, but it's definitely sparked some debate. It essentially says that for any collection of sets, you can always choose one element from each set, even if you have, well, an infinite number of sets. So it's like if you have an infinite shopping list and you can pick one thing from each store, even though there are infinitely many stores. Exactly. And it might sound simple, but it has some really profound consequences. For the Banach-Tarski paradox, the axiom of choice lets us make infinitely many choices all at once, which is crucial for building that paradoxical decomposition. So, without the axiom of choice, the whole paradox wouldn't work. Well, it's not quite that straightforward. The paradox relies heavily on the axiom of choice, but it's not the only factor at play. I mean, the axiom of choice is widely accepted today, but there are still mathematicians exploring alternative set theories, like uh, pointless topology, which might help us avoid these paradoxes without completely abandoning the axiom of choice. Pointless topology. So, in that system, there's no such thing as a point. How does that even work? It's a really fascinating area of math. Instead of focusing on individual points, pointless topology looks at the relationships between sets and their, uh, their neighborhoods. It's a different way of thinking about the foundations of math. And who knows, it might just help us avoid some of those paradoxical headaches. So there are different schools of thought, even within mathematics, about the best way to understand infinity in sets. Absolutely. That's what makes it so exciting. There's always more to explore and new perspectives to consider. All right, so let's take a step back and try to recap what we've learned about this mind-boggling paradox. We started with the seemingly impossible idea, duplicating solid objects just by moving them around. Right, and then we went down the rabbit hole of infinity and how sets can be manipulated in ways that completely defy our everyday experience. We discovered that free groups give us the tools to make these copies and that it's the lack of amenability in three dimensions that makes the paradox possible. And of course, we can't forget about those incredible Mycelsky sets where you can remove points without changing the overall size. And finally, we've got the axiom of choice, a fundamental but sometimes controversial principle that's crucial for creating this whole paradoxical decomposition. But its very necessity has led some mathematicians to explore alternative ways of thinking about the foundations of math just to see if maybe there's a way to sidestep these paradoxes. It really highlights how powerful and sometimes just plain, strange mathematical concepts can be, especially when we start dealing with infinity. So this is all super interesting from a mathematical perspective, but what does it actually mean for the rest of us, you know, the non-mathematicians? Does the Banach-Tarski paradox have any real-world applications, even if we can't, like, actually build a sun-sized P? That's a great question, and it's one that mathematicians and philosophers are still grappling with. While a physical realization is, well, impossible, it's possible that its implications could extend to fields like theoretical physics or computer science. For instance, there are connections to the study of fractals, which have that self-similarity at different scales. So maybe these paradoxes can give us new ways to understand complex systems or develop more efficient algorithms. Exactly. The Banach-Tarski paradox might seem like just a purely abstract mathematical curiosity, but it pushes us to think deeply about the nature of infinity, dimensionality, even the very foundation of mathematics itself. Who knows what doors that might open in other areas of science and technology? Well, you've definitely given me a lot to think about. Hopefully our listeners feeling that same sense of wonder about the strange and beautiful world of mathematical paradoxes. And hey, maybe it's even inspired you to do a little exploring on your own. Anything else you'd like to leave our listener with? I think the biggest takeaway is this. Don't be afraid to question what you think you know and embrace the unexpected. 
Sometimes the most counterintuitive ideas can lead to the most profound insights. The Banach-Tarsi paradox is a perfect example of that. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive for now. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep those minds open to the wonders of the universe, both the physical and the mathematical. It really shows you how math can like challenge our whole understanding of reality. It definitely makes you realize that there's so much more to math than just you know, numbers and equations. It's like exploring these abstract concepts and seeing where they lead you, even if it gets a little weird along the way. Exactly. And sometimes those weird paths can actually connect to other areas of math or even science. Remember those Mycelowski sets we were talking about? Well, they actually have some pretty interesting connections to topology. That's the study of shapes and spaces. Really? So those sets where like you can remove points without changing the size, they have something to do with shapes. How does that even work? Well, think of a Mycelsky set as having a kind of porosity to it. It's like a sponge. You can squeeze out some points, but the overall shape, the structure, it all stays the same. And that idea of porosity, it's really important in topology. It helps us understand how spaces can be connected and how they can change. Hmm. So maybe understanding those Mycelsky sets could give us insights into other porous structures in the real world, like... I don't know, the structure of a bone or a sponge even. That's a really interesting thought. Mathematicians and scientists are always looking for ways to apply these abstract mathematical ideas to, you know, real world problems. Who knows? Maybe someday our understanding of Mycelsky sets could lead to breakthroughs in like material science or medicine. That's pretty amazing to think about. It's like these paradoxes, even though they seem so strange and counterintuitive, they can spark new ideas and new connections that we might have never even considered otherwise. Exactly. They make us question everything we thought we knew and look at things from a completely different perspective. And speaking of questioning things, we haven't really touched on the philosophical side of the axiom of choice. I mean, it's not just a mathematical tool. It also raises some really fundamental questions about infinity and, well, the limits of what we can actually know. Yeah, you mentioned that some mathematicians are a little, I guess, wary of it. Why is that? What are they worried about with the axiom of choice? Well, some argue that it gives us too much power, you know, that it lets us create these crazy paradoxical decompositions that just don't seem logical. They're concerned that relying on the axiom of choice could lead to other counterintuitive results in math, maybe even contradictions. So it's like we're opening up this Pandora's box of weirdness with the axiom. In a way, yeah. But it's important to remember that math is all about pushing the boundaries, exploring what's possible, even if it takes us to some pretty uncomfortable places. And the whole debate surrounding the axiom of choice, it's a great example of how mathematicians are constantly questioning and refining the foundations of their field. That's a good point. It shows that math isn't just about, you know, finding the right answer. It's also about understanding the tools we're using and the assumptions we're making along the way. Absolutely. It's a field that's always evolving. And paradoxes like the Banach-Tarski paradox, they play a crucial role in challenging what we think we know and pushing those boundaries even further. So even though the Banach-Tarski paradox might not have like immediate practical uses, it's still incredibly valuable for helping us understand math and how it relates to the world around us. Absolutely. It reminds us that there's always more to learn and that even the most abstract ideas can have profound implications for how we see the universe. I think our listeners are probably feeling pretty mind blown by now. This deep dive has taken us through some pretty heavy stuff, but hopefully it's been an exciting journey into the world of mathematical paradoxes. I hope so, too. And I really hope it's inspired our listener to keep exploring and keep questioning everything. That's really what math is all about, you know. Well said. And on that note, we're going to keep diving into the Bonnick-Tarski paradox. Oh. Stick with us. Wow, we've really been through the ringer with this Bonnick-Tarski paradox. Started with this like simple idea about copying objects and ended up diving into infinity, free groups, even the very foundations of math. Like, whoa. It really shows you just how powerful mathematical thinking can be, you know? Even though the paradox itself might not have any like direct real world applications, just trying to understand it, it opens up these whole new ways of thinking. And that can be super valuable. You know, one thing that's been on my mind is how this whole paradox, it really challenges like our basic intuition about the world around us. We think of objects as having a set size and shape. But the Bonnick-Tarski paradox shows us that those ideas, they can get really fuzzy when we start messing around with infinity. Yeah, that's a good point. Our everyday experience is built on a finite world, right? Where yeah. things behave in pre-predictable ways. But when you step into the realm of the infinite, all bets are off. 
And that's how you get these crazy, mind-bending results. Makes you wonder, are there other paradoxes out there? Other counterintuitive things just waiting to be discovered that could totally change how we understand reality. Oh, I'm sure there are tons. Math is this huge, ever-expanding field, and there's always more to find, more to explore. Who knows what other wild ideas are out there just waiting to be uncovered. I'm definitely excited to keep learning and exploring, and I hope this deep dive has done the same for our listener, sparked some curiosity, maybe even a little wonder. Anything else you want to share before we wrap up? I think the biggest thing to take away from all of this is don't be afraid to question everything, you know? Challenge what you think you know. Embrace the unexpected. Sometimes those crazy counterintuitive ideas can lead to the most amazing insights. The Banach-Tarski paradox, it's a perfect example of that. Absolutely. It reminds us that even the most abstract, impossible seeming ideas can give us new knowledge, a deeper understanding of the universe. So until next time, stay curious and keep your mind open to all the infinite possibilities that math has to offer.